Welcome to Analyzing Global Trends for Business and Society. This class is about assessing the magnitude of global trends and their effects on a number of things such as consumer markets, labor markets, financial markets, politics, geopolitics, uh, natural resources, and more broadly, global relationships. I'm Mauro Guillén. I'm a professor at the Wharton School. I'm also the director of the Lauder Institute at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm originally from Spain, and I have one passion, which is analyzing global trends, trying to understand where the world is going. I have written 10 books and myriad articles on various aspects of globalization. Now, let me tell you a little bit more specifically uh, what are the kinds of issues that we're going to be analyzing in this class. Number one is, I would like to persuade you that global trends don't affect everybody in the same way. That is to say, global trends have different effects depending on the part of the world, depending on the country, depending on the industry, and also depending on the company. I would like to use the metaphor of the tornado as opposed to the tsunami. Global trends are not tsunamis. They don't change everything in their wake. What they do, however, is they have very large, profound effects in some parts of the world, in some industries, for some companies, but not for everybody. So as I just said, they behave more like tornadoes rather than tsunamis. I'd also like to propose to you that global trends entail both challenges and opportunities. Some of them are negative. They bring about bad things. But others create opportunities. They create new fields of activity. We're going to be analyzing both kinds of trends in this class. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, global trends are important, and it's very, very important, of course, to understand how they are playing out and to what extent they will change the world. And you may think that, well, all we need is really to think about new programs or new products that need to be launched into the marketplace in order to take advantage of those global trends. I want to persuade you in this class that a lot of companies will also need to change their business model. They will need to change the way in which they do business, not just the kinds of products or services that they sell in the global marketplace. I would also like to persuade you in this class that maybe not just companies but also individuals need to change the way in which they make decisions as a result of some of these global trends. In other words, we were born and raised in a particular time. And as the world evolves, as we see the manifestations of these global trends play out, we will probably need to change the way in which we make decisions. And finally, I think I would also like to persuade you that perhaps we even need a new mindset. We need to rethink the assumptions that we were taught at school as to how the world works. Because some of these global trends that we're going to be analyzing in this class have changed, have transformed the landscape. Now, I would like to start by asking you some initial questions here that uh, hopefully will generate discussion in the blogs that you're going to have to participate in for this class. So the first question is actually pretty simple. Do you believe that today there are more people in the world living in cities or in the countryside? That's the first question. The second is, do you believe there are more people in the world today suffering from hunger or more people in the world suffering from obesity? That's the second question. The third is, which of the following parts of the world do you believe are home to the largest consumer markets? Is it the US and Europe or is it China and India? And then the last question. Do you believe that today there are more failed states in the world or there are more dictatorships in the world? Well, let me give you a sense as to the answers uh, while you think about uh, the questions. The first question was about people living in cities versus people living in the countryside. Well, since the year 2009, we have more people for the first time in human history living in cities than in the countryside. How about hunger versus obesity? Well, since about the year 2010, we have more people in the world suffering from obesity than from hunger, which is kind of striking when you think about it. The third question, 
How about the size of consumer markets in the world? Well, today, Europe and the United States continue to be the largest consumer markets in the world. But within just 20 years, China and India will be larger as consumer markets than the US and Europe combined. And the last, uh, the fourth question that I asked you was about failed states and dictatorships. That's actually a relatively easy one because it's been a long time, more than 30 years, since we've had more failed states like Somalia or Iraq in the world than countries ruled by dictators. So these are some of the questions that I want you to reflect upon, questions that I want you to think about as you take this class. In this class, you will learn essentially three very important tools, I think, for understanding where the world is going and for taking action. The first is I'm going to show you how to use certain concepts and tools to analyze the extent to which the world is changing. Secondly, by taking this class, you will learn about the direction and the intensity of some of these global trends. And then lastly, I want you to go over in this class and grasp to what extent companies and entire societies are at risk as a result of some of these uh, global trends. Now, how do you take this class? Uh, it's a very simple process. So number one is before you watch the videos for each week of class, you should take an opinion survey that I have put together. And I will post the results within 24 hours of the deadline for completing it. Number two is you watch the mini lectures for each week. Number three is, of course, as you watch the lectures, try to answer the discussion questions that I will be posting on the PowerPoints. Number four is make sure that you have located those PowerPoints and you can follow them as you watch the lectures. Number three, number five, I'm sorry, is do the readings for the class. It's only one or at most two very short readings that we will make available for you on the website. Number six, at each of each, uh, at the end of each uh, week of class, please take the quiz. Uh, we will tell you, of course, in real time, which questions you are getting right and which you're getting wrong. And then finally, number seven, participate in the discussion forums and social media that we will make available as part of this class. Now, before we get any further, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about where the world is now and what are some of the manifestations of globalization. So, of course, when you think about globalization, I think most people think about ways in which cross-border activity, activity that takes place between countries in the world, has increased over the last 10 years or 20 years or 100 years. Some people also think about some supranational organizations such as the United Nations or the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. Or they think about forums like the World Economic Forum. When people think about globalization, they also think about attempts at organizing countries into blocks or groupings such as the European Union or the North American Free Trade Agreement. But globalization is not only about economic or financial issues, it's also about more broadly the spread of ideas and practices around the world. And I would like to also persuade you as part of this class that globalization is about awareness. That is to say, we are today so much more aware as to what's going on in different parts of the world than we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago. And this surely has an impact on us, on the decisions that we make. This surely has an impact on the decisions that companies make. And this surely has consequences and implications for what's going on in the world more broadly. Now, I just mentioned that a lot of people equate the global economy with globalization. And it is true that the global economy as we experience it today is a very important component of globalization. And it will be a very important aspect or topic that we will cover in this class. So when I think about the global economy, I think about increasing flows of labor, money, goods, services, and information that are just moving around the world. Think about the global economy, not just as countries relating to one another, but rather what's going on in different countries penetrating each other. Okay? 
I like a definition that was proposed by Manuel Castells. And he said, quote, the global economy is an economy with the capacity to work as a unit in real time on a planetary scale, unquote. And you see, every single word in that definition is very, very important. What's different about the global economy today compared to other periods in history is that we see that the global economy is coordinated in real time and that it has come to affect everything around the globe, not just in one particular part of the globe. So it is very different from the kind of let me call it international economy that we had in the 19th century, let's say 100 years ago or 150 years ago. It's also very different from the kind of global economy that was created in the wake of the discovery of the Americas in the 16th century. I strongly believe that in its present form, the global economy, this coordinated global economy, is something that is very recent, that really started to come into being in the 1980s, so about 25, 30 maybe 35 years ago at most. Now, why is the global economy so fascinating? You see, I started telling you that we're going to take a look in this class at the effects of globalization and global trends on a variety of topics, not just business topics or economic topics, but also politics, also people, societies, and so on and so forth. What I think is truly fascinating about the global economy and what's going on in the world right now is that we see a clash, we see a conflict between two very powerful ideas. Idea number one is the idea that the market should be left to its free unfolding. That is to say, the liberalism of the market. If you remember, there was a British economist, Adam Smith, who uh, more than 200 years ago, in 1776, wrote a very important book, and he wrote in that book, quote, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market." Unquote. And what he meant was that the larger the market, the more possibilities there are for specialization and for the division of labor. And therefore, the market will deliver better results to the extent that you remove boundaries. That's the liberalism of the market. Now, the second idea, which is, I believe, in conflict with the liberalism of the market, is the liberalism of citizenship. That is to say that we human beings in the modern world, most of us at least, have a country. We were born in some particular place and we're citizens of a particular country. That country gives us rights and obligations and it protects us. So in other words, the liberalism of citizenship is something that seeks to establish boundaries. Who is a citizen? Who is not a citizen? And in so doing, it's actually something that stands in contrast with the liberalism of the market, right? So one definition of what citizenship is, is, and I quote, relationship between an individual and a state with associated individual rights and obligations. So in this class, we're going to see many instances of conflict between the logic of the market and the logic of citizenship. Sometimes citizens of one country feel that they're not getting what they should be getting out of global economic exchange. They feel that maybe there are more downsides than benefits to their participation in the global economy. Those are some of the issues that we're going to be discussing uh, in this class. Let me show you a photograph that I think captures extremely well what I'm talking about, uh, which is the one that you, you can see here, uh, which was taken at a recent demonstration against one of these global meetings of uh, economic and financial leaders in the world. And underneath it is a quote, which I'm going to read, which says, join the international anti-globalization movement, unquote. And I took this quote from the website of a grassroots organization that is opposed to economic and financial globalization. And if you think about what the quote is saying, it's obviously a slogan, but it's a very peculiar slogan because on the one hand it says that it is against globalization, but at the same time it is essentially saying that, well, you know, join the international or the global struggle against globalization, which of course 
at some level at least, will also contribute to globalization itself. So these are the kinds of paradoxes, the kinds of problems that I would like you to think about as you take this class. In this second segment, we're going to get started with the subject matter. First, I would like to share with you some thoughts as to how we can measure globalization. And then we'll go into some basic definitions and conventions which we're going to be using throughout the course. And then lastly, I would like you to start thinking about how you make projections into the future. So first of all, how can we measure globalization? Well, first of all, there are some aggregate indicators that we can use, such as the level of trade or the level of cross-border investment or how many people are using the internet in different parts of the world, how many people are traveling as tourists from one country to another. Those are all aggregate indicators, and I'm going to show you some examples in a second. The second way of measuring globalization is with network data, relationships between countries or between individuals or between companies. Here's some example examples of the first kind of indicator. These are all aggregate indicators of globalization. Don't get scared about the table. I'm just going to discuss with you right now the very first indicator and the others we will discuss in other segments of this week and subsequent weeks. So what you can see on this table is a series of magnitudes that have to do with the global economy or with global financial markets or with the internet or with demography how many people are there in the world, and so on. And lastly, some political indicators. And I've given you essentially six, seven snapshots. 1980, 1985, 1990, 95, the year 2000, 2005, and 2010. So that you can see how these indicators evolve over time. So let me just use the first one to illustrate the point. So the first one is how much trade is there in the world? So I measure that with exports plus imports of goods and services. And then I divided that by the size of the global economy at each point in time. And so back in 1980, that indicator was 38.4%. And today, well, in the year 2010, that indicator had grown to 56%. So we see that the amount of trade in the world has grown over the last 25, 30 years. Now, you may be thinking, is that rate of growth very fast or very slow? Well, let me give you a sense as to how a few of these aggregate indicators have evolved over the last 25 years or 30 years. So since 1980, I just told you that exports plus imports have grown considerably. Well, to be more precise, they have grown from a standardized level of 100 in 1980 as an index to 146 by the year 2010. So that's a 46% increase, right, if you subtract 100. Now, let me take a look at a second indicator, foreign direct investment stock. So this is how much companies from different parts of the world have invested in countries that is not their home country. And we see here that the index number is 457 over the same time period, that is to say between 1980 and the year 2010. Well, that's a much faster rate of increase, okay? Let's take a look at the third indicator, daily currency exchange turnover. As you know, people exchange one currency for another every day. Companies also do that, and so do governments. When we add up all of those transactions, we can get an indicator as to how much globalization there is. Well, between 1980 and the year 2010, that indicator has grown ninefold, right? So the index number went from 100 to 900. There are four other indicators on the table that you can read. I would like to bring to your attention the last indicator, which is by a wide margin, the one that displays the largest rate of increase. And that's the number of books that have been written about globalization, about the topic that we're covering in this class. And that number has grown by more than 66 times over the last 25, 30 years. And I'm in part responsible for that, I told you. Uh, in the first uh, segment that I have written 10 books on globalization. So I am guilty as charged. Now, let's look at a more intuitive way of visualizing globalization, which is, let's take a look at a map of the world. 
And here what you have is a very recent phenomenon when you think about human history as a whole, which is the growth of the Internet. What you have on this map is global Internet traffic. And you can see a couple of things. First is that pretty much every part of the world is now an element, a component of the global Internet universe. But also, quite importantly, what you see is that there is one country in the world that seems to be sitting at the center of all of these flows, and that's the United States. And that, of course, is because the Internet was born here in the United States. And to this day, the global architecture of uh, Internet traffic in the world still has, continues to have, the United States at its center. Let me show you another example, which is actually a little bit older than the Internet, which is submarine cables. If you remember, it was more than 100 years ago in the 19th century when the first submarine cables were laid down in the floor of the ocean, linking Europe with the rest of the world at the time. Today, we see that these submarine cables are laid all over the world, and they connect different parts of the world. Let's get into uh, a few more precise definitions that we will need for this class. I just told you earlier that one way of measuring globalization is looking at how much trade there is in the world. But of course, you want to put that figure in perspective. You want to show how big trade is relative to, for example, the size of the global economy or the size of different countries. And I used earlier the concept of gross domestic product, GDP. Well, let me just give you a quick definition of what this is. This is the total value, normally expressed in US dollars, of the goods and services produced in an economy during a given year. Okay? Now, keep in mind that in the economy, we have various actors that participate in it. We have households. Sometimes you will refer to these as families. We also have companies or firms. We have financial institutions, including, of course, banks. And we have the government, of course. And each of these parts of the economy contributes or plays a role in gross domestic product. Now, another very important definition for our purposes here in this class is that of ratio. Uh, so a ratio is just a, very simply, one number divided by another. We will be using a lot of ratios in this class. So let me just give you an example. The total dependency ratio is a very important magnitude that we will be discussing several times throughout this class. This is essentially how many people do we have between the ages of 0 and 19 in a particular country, and how many people do we have above age 65. So we consider those two numbers. And then we divide those two numbers by how many people do we have in the middle, in between, between ages 20 and 64. So what this number is telling me is how many people are at an age in which they're supposed to be working versus how many people do we have at an age that they're supposed to be in school or they're supposed to be in retirement, which essentially means not working. So for example, in China, today the ratio is about 0 0.5, which essentially means, if you think about it, that they have twice, right? they have twice as many people working right now as they have people who are in school because they're children or people who are retired, typically because they are age 65 or above. But you know, one of the trends that we're going to be analyzing in this class is that that ratio is going to be changing very quickly around the world. And that certainly includes China, because the projection for China is that by the year 2075, that ratio is going to be about one unity, which essentially means that for every person who will be working in China in the year 2075, there will be either one person in school or one person above age 65 in retirement. Right? So the ratio will be exactly one. Okay? Now keep in mind that a ratio can also be expressed as a percentage by multiplying it by 100. So in some of the figures, in some of the charts, in some of the tables that we'll see in this class, you will notice that ratios sometimes are expressed in percentages. But it's essentially the same concept. Now, a second concept that I want you to keep in mind is that of the rate. So a rate is different than a ratio, because now we're incorporating a time dimension. So a rate is the pace, or the rhythm, or the speed at which a certain magnitude changes 
over a certain period of time. Okay, and it's typically expressed as a percentage. So for example, I could tell you the growth rate of gross domestic product during the year 2012 in China was 7.8%. And in the United States, during the same year, 2012, it was just 2.2%. So what that means, of course, is that the Chinese economy grew much faster than the U.S. economy during the year 2012. Another example would be the inflation rate, which, as you know, measures how fast prices are changing. So, for example, in the year 2012, the inflation rate in China was 2.6%. So compared to the beginning of the year, prices on average in China were 2.6% higher or greater at the end of that year. Now, I'd also like to bring to your attention something really important, which is that when you read the papers, you will notice that journalists misuse the word rate when they refer to unemployment. Because the unemployment rate is actually not a correct usage of the term rate. It should be really called the unemployment ratio. But that's a minor point that I wanted to make. Uh, before telling you about another kind of uh, number that we're going to be using here that uh, I already introduced to you earlier when I told you that books is one of the fastest growing or perhaps the fastest growing indicator of globalization. I was telling you about index numbers. So the index number just essentially reveals the change in a magnitude between two points in time, right? So it could be at the beginning of the decade of the 1980s, between 1980, let's say, and the end of that decade, uh, at the end of uh, 1989. And typically, the index number is set to a base of 100. So for example, if the economy in China, if Chinese GDP, right, gross domestic product, grew by 7.8% during the year 2012, then the index number for the end of that year is 107.8, right? So that's the index number. And then finally, we are also going to be using another kind of uh, numerical concept here, which is that of the proportion, okay? So the proportion is how big is a certain part relative to the whole, right? And it's typically expressed as a percentage. So for instance, we can say in a particular classroom, what's the percentage of women among all of the students in that classroom? But to give you an example of uh, a magnitude that we will be discussing in this class, for instance, the income of the 1% richest Americans was 7.8% of total income in 1970. That is to say, okay, of all income in the United States, the top 1% accounted for 7.8% back in 1970. Now, you know what that proportion is as of today, actually as of the end of 2012? Well, that proportion is 19.3%. It's almost three times as big as it was in 1970. This is one of the topics that we will be discussing later on in this class, in another week of class. The growth in income inequality, not just in the United States, but also in other parts of the world. Now, before we leave this segment about numbers and about concepts that we're going to be using in this class, let me also bring to your attention something that is really important in case you're taking this class from outside of the United States. So here in the U.S., when we say one billion, we mean a number one followed by nine zeros, okay? And when we say one trillion, what we mean is a number one followed by... 12 zeros. However, in many other parts of the world, 1 billion and 1 trillion are actually very different numbers. Okay? So in some parts of the world, not the US, 1 billion is actually a 1 followed by 12 zeros. And 1 trillion is a 1 followed by 3 times 6. So that's 18 zeros. Okay? So it's a trillion in the US is a much smaller number than in other parts of the world, and so is a billion. Now for this class, in all of the tables, all of the figures, all of the maps that I'm going to be using, I will follow the US convention. So one billion will be what you see on the screen, which is a number one followed by nine zeros, and one trillion will be followed by um, 12 zeros. Now let me end this segment with a very important discussion question for you.
which is how do we make projections into the future? Because as I told you at the beginning, this class is all about analyzing where the world is going from an economic point of view, from a political point of view, from the point of view of population and so on and so forth. And the example that I would like to use has to do with population. There are seven billion people in the world. And you see that on this chart over here, that that figure has grown from about 2.5 billion to 7 billion between 1950 and the present time. And the issue is, how do we make projections into the future? So the United Nations has a whole bunch of demographers, people who study populations. And they have come up with four future scenarios as to the growth of the human population on planet Earth. And you can see them on this chart. They came up with a constant steady state kind of projection, and then with high, a medium, and a low projections. And as you can see, the world is going to be very different depending on which of these projections do you believe. They've crunched the numbers all the way until the end of the 21st century, until the year 2100. My question to you is, which of these four projections do you believe is the least likely to become true as we make progress throughout the 21st century? Think about it. Essentially, what you need to do is to think about what are the assumptions that go into making these calculations. So let me give you a hint. Those demographers at the United Nations essentially made different assumptions as to how many babies are going to be born per woman in the world over the next 90 years until the end of the 21st century. So they came up with a high scenario and a medium scenario and a low scenario as to how many children would be born to each woman in the world. Now, the constant scenario is the assumption that women are going to have throughout this century, the 21st century, the exact same number of babies as they're currently having. So once again, my question to you is, which is the least likely of the four scenarios that you see reflected on this chart? Let me give you the answer. The answer is that the least likely scenario is that nothing will change. So that's the constant, in this case, fertility, right? So fertility is the number of children per woman. That's the least likely scenario. Most of the debate, as we shall see in week two of this class, has to do with whether we're going to be at the high end or somewhere in the middle or at the low end of the other projections. But we are very unlikely to find ourselves at the end of the 21st century at uh, the constant scenario, which essentially would mean that the population in the world would approach 30 billion people. In our third segment, we are going to understand to what extent international trade, foreign investment, and multinational firms have become more important in the world. These are three interrelated topics. They happen to be very important to what we understand nowadays as the global economy. So number one is international trade. So this is just simply flows across borders of goods and services. So Germany sells automobiles to Brazil. Brazil sells iron ore to China. China sells electronics to the United States. That's what I'm talking about. Now, you might be wondering, why do countries trade with each other? And as you know, the standard theory to understand that is called the theory of comparative advantage. Now, before we get into the details as to what comparative advantage means, I'd like to bring up a very important issue, which is that a lot of people assume that trade is good, and under many circumstances, it is very, very good. But it is also the case that trade generates winners and losers. And I'm going to tell you more about that within this lecture. Today I'm at the Panama Canal, which was built in the early 20th century with uh, mostly U.S. resources. And I think this is a great place in which to discuss the role that trade plays in the global economy. Trade, of course, is a fundamental phenomenon 
It is something that contributes to economic efficiency, something that contributes to specialization. Uh, but it's also something that creates problems every now and then because it can displace workers from their jobs. It can create new jobs in certain parts of the world and destroy jobs in other parts of the world. So trade is always a political phenomenon as well as an economic one. Most of the traffic originates in Asia and has as its destination the eastern coast of the United States. However, it is intriguing to note that it's actually cheaper to unload the cargo from the ship in Los Angeles, for instance, and then put it on a train for distribution in the interior of the United States. Still, the canal is very important to the global economy, to global trade, and also to Panama as a country, which wouldn't have become the hub of global commerce and finance that it has over the last 100 years. So first, the theory of comparative advantage. Let's go back to Adam Smith, the British economist. So he published in 1776, The Wealth of Nations. And in one, on one page of the book, you would come across the following quotation. Quote, if a foreign country can supply us with a commodity cheaper than we ourselves can make it, better buy it of them with some part of the produce of our own industry, employed in a way in which we have some advantage. So essentially what Adam Smith is saying, hey, it's better not to produce something if we can buy it from somebody else at a cheaper price. So Adam Smith proposed a theory of absolute comparative advantage. If you can buy a particular good at a cheaper price from somebody else, then you should do so. Now, in 1819, another British economist, David Ricardo, essentially argued that Adam Smith was correct, but not completely correct. He essentially used the examples of uh, Britain and Portugal. At the time, Britain and Portugal, both of them, were making cloth, textiles, and also wine. But Portugal could make both of them at a cheaper price than Britain. Now, what David Ricardo said was that it really matters what is the price difference between the two countries. So Britain, for example, could produce a unit of cloth for 100 and Portugal could produce the same unit of cloth of the same quality for just 90. Okay, so there was a 10 um, difference in terms of the currency. Let's say it was pounds, okay, at the time. When it came to wine, however, Portugal's advantage was much bigger. So Britain could produce wine at a cost of 110, whereas Portugal could produce it at a price of 80. Now, if you think about the example, it seems as if it has to be true. If you've ever tasted British wine, you would recognize that, well, it seems as if the Portuguese should be making the wine and the British should be making something else. But Ricardo's point was different. His point was that Britain had less of a disadvantage with cloth than with wine. And so it would make sense for the British to make the cloth and the Portuguese to make the wine. And from the Portuguese perspective, the Portuguese had more of an advantage in making wine than in making cloth. So this is called the theory of relative comparative advantage. I am standing on top of the Real Fuerza fortress in Havana. This is one of the fortifications built by the Spaniards, which was supposed to keep this most strategic harbor safe. Here we can see the entrance from the ocean. The channel is very narrow and it's made for a superb natural harbor. And also the island was rich in forests with all sorts of woods that could be used for shipbuilding and for repairs. Now remember that for centuries Cuba would export sugar and also, of course, precious metals that had come to, from Mexico and Peru and were bound for Spain. They would be stored here for months at a time and then put on ships. So in these vaults inside of the Real Fuerza fortress in Havana is where the Spaniards kept the gold and the silver coming from Peru and Mexico while the fleet was being prepared.
for the journey back to Spain. I'm here at the Hotel Nacional. This was the most important playground for wealthy Americans and also for the Mafia during the time of Prohibition and also after Prohibition was abolished in the United States. It continued to be a major meeting point for the aristocracy, and, uh, for wealthy people and for actors and actresses. I'm on top of the Bacardi building in Havana, Cuba today. And I would like to use this opportunity to illustrate the problem of winners and losers when it comes to international trade. This was built in the 1930s by Emilio Bacardi, a sugar magnate that then decided to go into rum and made a fortune out of it. Here what you see is the entrance to the harbor of Havana. 500 years ago, this became the most important harbor in the Americas. The Spanish galleons filled with gold would assemble here and then make the journey back to Spain. But today, although the Havana Harbor continues to be the most important of Cuba, there's almost no traffic. They tell me that at most eight or 10 ships make it in and out of the Havana Harbor every day. That's because of the US embargo, which has been in place since the 1950s. The reason, of course, is that neighbors trade with each other a lot. And therefore, for example, the US most important trading partner happens to be Canada, Mexico. It's also a very important US trading partner. The most important trading partner for Germany is the rest of Europe and vice versa. So Cuba has been hurt immensely by the US embargo. And today, as you can see in the footage, there's very little by way of trade in and out of Cuba. Now, comparative advantage is not the only thing that matters when it comes to trade. We will discuss in other weeks of this class that transportation costs also matter, because of course, if you produce something very far away from where it's going to be consumed, you need to incur in a shipping cost. There's also other costs of trade, of coordinating all of the flows of goods and services around the world. Maybe scale economies, maybe product differentiation also play a role. So I, I just wanted to alert you today to the fact that there are other considerations above and beyond relative comparative advantage. Now take a look at the table that I showed you in a previous segment with aggregate indicators of globalization. And now focus your attention on the first three rows. So remember here we have the evolution of certain magnitudes between the year 1980 and the year at five year intervals. So the first three rows have to do with trade. The first the magnitude we already discussed, exports plus imports expressed as a percentage of GDP. It has grown from 38.4% to 56 0.0% at the end of this period. Now the next two lines give you the exact same magnitude but broken down by the income level of countries in the world. So first I give you the evolution of this magnitude of trade divided by GDP for the developed countries in the world. So that's mostly Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, Japan, Singapore and so on. And you can see that yes there's been an increase from 39.5% to 55.9% over this time period. Now the third and last line that I want to bring to your attention at this point is the same magnitude but for emerging and developing countries. So here we have China, India, all of Latin America, all of Africa and so on. And here you can see that the increase has been actually much faster. It started at a level of 32.8% and then it went all the way throughout this period to a level of 56.7%. So this is just to show you that emerging economies, especially the emerging economies, but also developing countries, have become so much more exposed to trade, exports and imports, over the last 25, 30 years. I'm here on the main island of Bermuda. Uh, this was discovered by the Spaniards in 1505 and today is a British uh, overseas territory. And as you can see, it is raining today, which is actually very important on this island because that's uh, the only source of fresh water. But there's another thing that rains on Bermuda, that's insurance companies. And it's home to 15,000 insurance companies. Most of them actually don't have an office, they don't have employees here, they use uh, 
local accountants uh, to do their business. Uh, this has become a big cluster. It's a very small place in the middle of the Atlantic, but it plays a very important role in the global economy. So one important manifestation of globalization, as we just uh, discussed, is international trade, exports and imports of goods and services. Another very important manifestation is the phenomenon of multinational enterprises, MNEs. These are companies that have operations in at least two different countries. So the Coca-Cola company, Volkswagen of Germany, or Apple, they all have factories or they may have research centers or they may have distribution channels or stores in many different countries around the world. These are all multinational enterprises. Another very important term that I would like to introduce here is that of foreign direct investment, FDI. These are the investments that multinational enterprises undertake in order to produce or to sell their products and services in multiple countries around the world. Now, how many of these firms are there in the world today? Well, there's quite a few of them. The United Nations estimates that there's more than 100,000, about 104,000 of these multinational enterprises in the world, to be precise. Collectively, they control nearly 800,000 subsidiaries around the world. Those are the companies that they have set up in different parts of the world in order to produce or in order to sell their goods and services. Now, a very important fact about the multinational enterprises, 71% of them happen to be from the developed part of the world, from Europe, from the United States, from Canada, Australia, Japan, those kinds of countries. Now, even more tellingly, just to show you how important multinational enterprises have become in the global economy, the 500 largest of these firms account for about 25% of world product, of all of the goods and services produced in the world. And they also account for about half, 50% of all trade in the world. So you cannot understand the global economy without thinking about multinational enterprises and how they make decisions. And also quite importantly, multinational enterprises own most of the technology in the world. So we all know about Apple or about Samsung or about pharmaceutical firms. Of course, they do a lot of R&D, research and development, and so they obtain patents. And so, of course, they get money out of their inventions, out of the products that they've designed. Well, about 80% of all of the payments in the world for technology, royalties, and fees accrue to multinational enterprises. They don't go to inventors, to individuals, such as Thomas Edison, okay? They go to companies multinational enterprises that own all of that technology. Now think about also another very important aspect of these multinational firms, which is that they have become very peculiar in terms of the way in which they are organized. And here I would like to quote you from a book written by Jerry Davis, who is a professor at the University of Michigan. He wrote, quote, the, co the Tommy Hilfiger Corporation is headquartered in Hong Kong, incorporated in the British Virgin Islands. It is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It's owned primarily by international institutional investors. Held its annual meeting of shareholders in Barbados, that's in the Caribbean by the way. Sourced production to manufacturers in Mexico and Asia. Licensed its name to producers globally and retailed its classic American clothing in Europe and North America." Unquote. This is just one example of a multinational corporation. As you can see, this is a multinational corporation that plays or acquires different ways of operating depending on the country and that uses all of the resources at its disposal to operate on a worldwide scale. So here's some discussion questions for you so that you get a better sense as to what's going on in the world right now regarding multinational enterprises and foreign direct investment. The first question is, which country in the world do you think is the one that has the multinational firms that have invested the biggest amount of money up until the present time? Which country in the world? And then the second discussion question is, which country do you think occupies spot number two on that ranking? Well, I haven't given you the data yet to answer these questions. And in this table, you can find all the data about foreign direct investment 
at two points in time, 1990 and the year 2012. And I've given you the figures first in absolute terms, so these are measured in billions, American billions of dollars, and those are columns number one and number two on that table. And then column number three and number four, I give you the same numbers, but just to put them in perspective, I divided those figures by the GDP of each country. And if you examine the table carefully, you will find that it is American firms, companies from the United States, that have invested the largest amount of money to date outside of the home country, outside of the United States in this case. And that figure, if you look down the table in the second column for the year 2012, is $5,191.2 billion. That's the number one country in terms of foreign direct investment in the world. Now, if you examine the table carefully, once again for the year 2012, you will notice that it's not that easy to actually determine which is the second country. Because if you just take a look at the numbers in the second column, then you would probably conclude that it is British companies. Because the UK has a figure that is $1,808.2 billion, and that's the second highest after the United States. However, if you take a look at the top of the table, the first two rows, you will notice that if you add China, China's figures to Hong Kong's figure, then you actually get an amount that is slightly bigger than that for the United Kingdom. And of course, I'm not making any claims here as to uh, the fact that maybe these statistics should have been reported in a combined way for both China and Hong Kong. But what's important for you to keep in mind is that a lot of the investment that comes out of Hong Kong is actually investment that originated from China, but then went through Hong Kong, and then from Hong Kong, the money was uh, sent to other parts of the world. So with all of these examples of trade and the activities of multinational firms in the world, what we're seeing is two of the most important manifestations of globalization. Now let's turn to another manifestation of economic globalization, which has to do with financial markets. Uh, financial globalization, of course, has become the fastest growing indicator of globalization overall. Remember, except for books written on globalization. And let me show you uh, some of the important aspects of this uh, continuing trend towards greater globalization in the world from a financial point of view. So first of all, we have something called foreign portfolio investment. That is to say when individuals or even companies invest in other countries, but they buy just a few shares of companies instead of setting up their own manufacturing plant or instead of uh, setting up a distribution channel or stores. They're just buying a little bit of a company that already exists in a foreign country. That's one manifestation of financial globalization. Another very important manifestation is, of course, the currency markets, where you can go and you can exchange dollars for yens, let's say, or euros for dollars. Well, keep in mind something really important about currency markets in the world, which is that only 10% just 10% of the transactions in global currency markets have to do with commercial purposes. That is to say, I'm here in the United States, I want to buy something from abroad, let's say from France, so I need to exchange a few dollars into euros. Or another commercial transaction would be if I travel to one of those countries, or if a company wants to buy something in a foreign market. Those are all commercial transactions. Well, we estimate that no more than 10% of all of the currency exchange turnover in the world in currency markets has to do with commercial transactions. So let's discuss the following question. The question is, what accounts for the other 90%? Why do we observe so much currency being transacted in the world, but just 10% is for commercial purposes? So think about it. Why else would people want to exchange one currency for another? The answer is the following, which is to try to make money for speculation. So this is kind of amazing, and this is a new development, really, that didn't exist 100 or 200 years ago, that so much of the market for different currencies in the world has to do with speculation. The other thing that I want to bring to your attention here is banks. Um, so if we go to the table that I show you in previous segments with indicators of globalization, once again between the year 1980 and the year 
2010. And if you go halfway down the table to where you see under letter B, financial, three indicators, you will first come across daily currency exchange turnover as a percentage of GDP in the world. And you can see that it has increased from 0.7% to 6.3% as of the end of 2010. That's a very fast rate of increase. We've already covered that. But what we also see is that banks have also become so much more globalized over the last 30 years. So I've chosen two indicators. I don't want to get into the technicalities as to what exactly they mean, but they have to do with the activities that banks perform across borders. And you can see that although they haven't increased these two indicators as fast as daily currency exchange turnover, they have also raised much higher levels than back in 1980. Now, let me show you another way of capturing financial globalization, which is by looking at how many connections there are in the world in terms of banks from one country either borrowing or lending money to banks in another country. So here you see a chart that was put together by two economists at the International Monetary Fund. And what you can see is that the interconnectedness from a financial and banking point of view in the world between the year 1985 and the year 2010 has grown many times over. Okay, so here essentially what you have is out of all of the possible bilateral links between banks located in different countries in the world, how many of those links were actually instances of money being borrowed or being lent? And once again, what you can see here is that especially since the 1990s, over the last 15 or 20 years, there's been a dramatic increase in financial interconnectedness in the world. Now, by the same two authors, you can see here a better way of uh, assessing, capturing, measuring to what extent the world has become so much more interconnected from a financial point of view. So here what we have is two photographs, so to speak the world in 1980 and the world in the year 2007. And what you can see is all of the different connections of banks in different countries in the world either borrowing or lending money. And what you can appreciate is that between the year 1980 and the year 2007, this network of banking relationships in the world has become so much more dense. It has become so much more populated by different links between pairs of countries. This is one of the most important characteristics of financial globalization in recent decades. That is to say that the global banking system has become so much more interconnected, so much more complex. And some people argue that this is a very important thing to take into consideration when analyzing, for example, the global financial crisis that started in the year 2008. In another week of this class, we will analyze exactly how this increase in interconnectedness paved the road towards one of the most significant financial crises that the world has ever seen, which, if you remember, started in September of 2008 with the collapse of Lehman Brothers. But let me also show you another way in which there is interconnectedness in the world manifests itself because we've just seen it from a financial point of view, but it also is readily apparent when you take a look at the economy as a whole. Here what we have on this chart is between the year 1970 and the year 2010, what percentage of the richest countries in the world, those in Europe, the US, Canada, Australia, Japan, what percentage of these countries were in a recession? That is to say they reported at least two consecutive quarters of GDP decline, which is the standard definition of a recession. And as you can see, at the time of the first oil crisis in the 1970s, well, at most 40 or 42 percent of countries in the world entered into a recession. And then once again, at the beginning of the 80s, when there was another episode of economic recession in the world, we see that up to 30 percent of countries, rich countries in the world, reported two or more consecutive 
quarters of GDP decline. And the same thing happened again in the early 1990s when, again, the global economy went uh, through some problems. But you see, in the recession that was brought about by the global financial crisis of 2008, every single country among those in the world with a high income, the rich countries, actually entered into a recession. You can see it on the right-hand side of the chart. 100% of the rich countries in the world reported being in a recession. So once again, something has changed in the world. The world is much more interconnected. If there's a few countries over here that have a problem, then that problem also starts manifesting itself in other countries that were originally not affected by the problem. And we see this very clearly in this chart about the Great Recession. This is why it was called the Great Recession, because pretty much every single rich country in the world was affected by it. Now, in this segment, I would like to share with you a different concept about globalization and about global trends, where the world is going. And this is the concept of isomorphism. Now, this may come across as a difficult word, and it is kind of a technical term, but what it means is essentially that entities in the world are becoming more similar, okay? They're becoming equal in form, which is what the word isomorphism really means. And I would like to take this opportunity to also tell you about what is driving globalization? What are the kinds of things that are producing all of this economic, financial globalization that we see in the world? First of all, let me give you a more formal definition of isomorphism. So isomorphism is the tendency of actors, organizations, companies, or other types of entities, it could be countries for instance, to become more similar or to adopt common patterns of behavior over time. Okay. And so isomorphism can result from several dynamics, and I'm going to call these dynamics drivers. And I believe that these drivers are very much responsible for all of this economic and financial globalization that we observe in the world these days. Now, before I tell you about the specific drivers behind globalization, let me show you some examples of isomorphism. So one obvious example of isomorphism is the so-called modern nation state. That is to say that countries in the world have adopted common structures. They all have a government. Those that are democracies have a parliament. And then they have judges that try to resolve disputes. So they have created a series of institutions that we normally associate with the modern nation state. That's an instance of isomorphism. In other words, different countries in the world adopting the same kind of thing. Another uh, example of isomorphism is, let's say, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in the United States, it's called the State Department. Every country in the world has somebody in charge of the relationships between that country and the rest of the world. In the United States, it's called the Secretary of State. In other countries around the world, it's called the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Another example of isomorphism is the adoption of prohibitions around the world regarding child labor, under the assumption that children should be in school and not uh, working at a certain age. Another example of isomorphism is general schooling, the idea that, as I just mentioned, well, maybe all children between certain ages should be in school. And therefore, of course, then countries set up schooling systems so that those children can be educated. Another example of isomorphism could be tourism promotion offices. Pretty much every country in the world I've visited has a tourism promotion office that helps you um, find the interesting spots and uh, helps you essentially uh, look for the kinds of uh, things in the country to enjoy while you're there. Another one would be newspapers. I know no country in the world that doesn't have at least one newspaper. But there's also other examples of isomorphism. For example, blue jeans, which is by far the most universal piece of clothing that the world has ever seen. Or pop music, which is of course also universally accepted as an art form and as a form of entertainment. So those are all examples of isomorphism. Now let's go back to the drivers. <clears throat> why do countries in the world, why do individuals in the world, why do companies in the world, in many cases, adopt similar patterns of behavior. This is very important 
when analyzing globalization. Well, on this table that you see here, I have listed what are, from my point of view, the five most important drivers behind this common adoption of the same practices or the same forms or the same structures. So let me read them. It's normative, coercive, mimetic, emulative, and competitive. Okay? So what is normative isomorphism? Well, this is all about we all share the same ideology or the same worldview or the same framework. And therefore, then, we adopt things that are consistent with those beliefs. Let me give you an example. If you believe that the best way to formulate economic policy is to follow the prescriptions of this very famous British economist by the name of John Maynard Keynes, then, well, you're going to be adopting policies right, that are very similar across countries if everybody believes that that's the best way to design economic policies. Or if you believe in democracy as the best form of government, then needless to say, you're going to set up institutions such as the parliament or such as the government that will have very strong similarities in different countries that are all uh, very interested in adopting democracy as their form of government. We can also think about culture, or we can, talk, uh, we can think about legal traditions as also producing what I'm calling normative isomorphism. Now, a very different kind of driver is the second one that you see on the table, which is coercive isomorphism. So this is driven by power and by dependency. So we all know that there are some countries in the world, for example, that are more powerful than others. And what this essentially means is that then other countries that feel dependent on those more powerful countries will adopt patterns of behavior that the more powerful countries have previously adopted. Some people have also argued that some international organizations, such as the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, engage in coercive isomorphism because, well, maybe the World Bank or the IMF doesn't give you a loan unless you introduce certain types of economic reforms or even political reforms or institutional reforms in your country. Some people have also argued that multinational corporations, because they are so big and so powerful, can also have a coercive isomorphic effect. That is to say, well, I'm a big company, I buy a lot of clothes from Bangladesh, I can influence things that are going on in Bangladesh, such as, for example, labor regulations or environmental regulations, because I have a lot of power. I'm a large firm buying a lot of clothes in Bangladesh. That's the second kind of isomorphism. A third kind is mimetic isomorphism. What we see in the world is that companies, individuals, countries, they imitate each other. They mimic each other. They see what's going on. They try to identify what the fad is, what has become fashionable, and they engage in the same practice or they adopt the same pattern of behavior. This is called, once again, mimetic isomorphism. And we, we see a lot of this in the world. Another different kind of mechanism is emulation. That is to say, different companies in the world, for example, identify Apple as being by far the most successful firm in the personal device industry. Right? So they imitate what Apple does. But imitation is not really the most appropriate term. What they do is they're emulating Apple. Right? They want to be like Apple. The same goes for countries. Some countries in the world want to emulate the most successful country in the world in, certain, in a certain respect. So as you know, for instance, a lot of countries around the world want to replicate the Silicon Valley in their own uh, country. They want to create something as innovative and as powerful as the Silicon Valley. And then the last mechanism in terms of isomorphism and globalization in the world has to do with competition. Let's not forget about this one because it actually happens to be perhaps the most pervasive one which is that markets generate a lot of isomorphism in the world. They compel everybody to conform because markets, as you know, select the most efficient things, the most efficient techniques, the most efficient processes. And therefore, as a result, they can become a very powerful force in terms of producing globalization and producing uh, isomorphism in the world. Now, don't get me wrong, not every country in the world, not every company, not every individual is exposed 
to the same extent to the five drivers of globalization that I just told you about, normative, coercive, mimetic, emulative, and competitive. So let me illustrate the point that I'm making with the example of countries. So I just told you earlier that more dependent countries are more exposed to the forces of globalization. If a particular country is very dependent on another, let's say, because it lacks oil or it lacks fresh water, it's going to be more exposed to the forces of globalization. By the same token, we have also found that democracies in the world, countries that have a democratic form of government, they're far more exposed to globalization than countries that are dictatorships. In another week in this class, I will explain to you more in detail why that's the case. Democracies, just in general, this is what maybe you should uh, think about, is are more open systems. And therefore, they're going to be so much more exposed to whatever influences, to whatever forces are at play in the global landscape. And then lastly, let me also share with you another type of country that is more exposed to globalization than the average country in the world. And these are countries that have smaller levels of public spending. Yes, the size of the government, how much money the government spends on services such as education or old age pensions or unemployment benefits or building roads and so on and so forth. The idea here is actually different, slightly different, which is that countries that have very big governments and they have a lot of public spending have more of a cushion, more of a protective uh, tissue to essentially shield themselves from all of the shocks and all of the big changes that are taking place in the global economy. We will also revisit this topic in a subsequent week of class. So as you go through the material for this class, I would like you to think about something that I call the paradoxes of globalization. I think that the world has become extremely paradoxical in at least three different ways. One is, to what extent can we predict what's going to happen? So you see, on the one hand, the global system as we know it today is highly structured. We understand you know, the different flows of money, people, information, and so on and so forth that occur in the world, and we can kind of predict what's going to happen next year based on what has happened in previous years. That's on the one hand. But on the other, we also know that the world is becoming unpredictable, that it has become so much more prone to disruption, crisis, and even systemic breakdown, as we saw in the global financial crisis that started in 2008. So this is the first paradox that I wanted to share with you today is the paradox of predictability. Once again, on the one hand, it seems as if we can predict things, but then something happens and things unravel in ways that we could not possibly have predicted. Now the second paradox, the second paradox is what I call the paradox of coupling. That is to say, the world has become a much smaller place has become also a place in which everything is so much more interconnected, tightly interconnected. That's what I called coupling, tight coupling. So in other words, different parts of the world, different components, maybe different markets, the labor market, financial markets, consumption markets, and so on, have become very interrelated. Think not only in terms of economic or financial globalization, think about the environment, the physical environment in the world. We know that if farmers in Brazil clear areas of the Amazon, that's going to have implications not just for Brazil in terms of deforestation. That's going to have implications globally in terms of global warming because the Amazon is right now one of the most important components of the global ecosystem. The world has also become so much more tightly coupled from a demographic point of view. We're going to be analyzing that in depth in another week. But think about it. As population has grown in certain parts of the world more than in others, what we see is more migration 
out of those parts of the world with excess population into other parts of the world where there's still jobs. This has essentially created more interconnections in the world, a tighter coupling of the global landscape, using my terminology. But at the same time, and here's the paradox, the second paradox, at the same time that the world has become more tightly coupled, what we see is that there has been a decoupling in the following sense, which is that we observe companies in the world, we observe countries in the world adopting very similar patterns of behavior, very similar structures, but they do not obtain the same kind of outcomes out of adopting those structures or those patterns of behavior. Let me illustrate. So most companies in the world these days try to organize internally a research and development lab because they have learned that it is very important in order to be competitive to set up such a unit inside of their organization. But we also know that some companies in the world, especially from certain countries, continue to be so much more innovative than companies from other parts of the world, in spite of the fact that both of them have actually set up R&D laboratories. So this is what I call the paradox of coupling. On the one hand, the world has become more tightly coupled. On the other, there is decoupling in terms of the kinds of things that people or companies or entire countries do and what are the kinds of outcomes, what are the kinds of benefits that they get from adopting those common structures or patterns of behavior. That's the second paradox. And the third paradox is the paradox of convergence in the world. At the same time that we observe convergence, we also observe a lot of differentiation in the world. So let me give you an example. We see that countries in the world for instance, are catching up with one another. The poor countries in the world are not as poor as they were 20 or 30 years ago. They have reduced the gap that separated them from the rich countries in the world over the last 20 years or so. So that is convergence in the world, at least from the point of view of income levels. But at the same time, what we see is very different experiences in each of those countries that are catching up in terms of how that income is distributed or in terms of how they have managed to reach a higher level of development. For instance, they have differentiated the role that they play in the global economy. So once again, to summarize, I would like you to keep in mind as you go through the different videos and the different readings for this class, that we are at a time at which three kinds of paradoxes are manifesting themselves. The paradox of predictability, the paradox of coupling, and the paradox of convergence in the world. Another very important aspect of globalization that I would like you to keep in mind as you watch the videos and you do the readings for this class has to do with the effects of globalization, with the consequences. And I would like to bring up the issue of uh, the winners and the losers in globalization. Let me start by throwing at you a couple of discussion questions. The first has to do with inequality. The question is the following. Do you believe there is more or less inequality in the world today compared to 10 or 20 or 30 years ago? In other words, what's the trend in terms of inequality? And then secondly, do you believe that globalization is responsible for changes in inequality as we are experiencing in the, them in the world today. I'm not going to give you full answers to these questions this week because we're going to be digging very deep into the issue of global inequality. But let me just preview some of what we're going to be discussing. First of all, actually pretty much any answer would be correct because from one point of view, there's more inequality in the world today than 20 years ago. From other points of view, however, there's less inequality in the world today than 20 years ago. So for instance, there's far less inequality in the world today across countries. That is to say, as I mentioned previously in another video, the poor countries in the world have reduced the gap separating them from the rich countries in the world. We can see that very clearly on this chart over here. We have a measure of inequality 
vertically in the chart called the Gini coefficient. And what we see is that since more or less the turn of the 21st century, there is less inequality across countries in the world. And that's actually true even if you exclude China from the calculation. Because as you know, of course, China has grown very quickly over the last 20 or 25 years and therefore has made a big contribution to reducing inequalities in the world. However, from the point of view of inequality within countries, the trend in the world right now is so much more complex. In this first chart, you see indicators of inequality within developed countries in the world. And you can see very clearly that, for example, in the United States, inequality has been on the increase since the 1970s. Whereas in some European countries, inequality actually has either remained relatively stable or has been dropping slightly over the last few years. Now, you take a look at developing countries in the world and also at emerging economies, you observe more or less the same thing. In China or in Russia, for instance, we see that inequality within each of those countries has been growing over the last 20 years. And at the same time, in places like Brazil or Colombia or Mexico, actually inequality has been coming down. Now also notice, of course, that although inequality has been coming down in Latin America over the last 10 or 15 years, the region as a whole and each of the countries in Latin America individually actually continue to have higher levels of inequality than most of the countries in Asia. So once again, we will revisit this topic of inequality in another week of class, but I wanted to give you a glimpse today as to where some of the more important trends regarding winners and losers in terms of globalization. But let me also give you some more food for thought so that you have more things to think about as you uh, watch the videos for this class. There's a lot of people out there who argue that capital has won as a result of globalization. That is to say, people who own capital, who have financial investments, but at the same time, labor has lost as a result of globalization. That's something that I would like you to consider, to ponder once again as you move through this class. A second kind of contrast that I would like to establish here between winners and losers has to do with educated versus unskilled workers. So a lot of experts argue that educated workers have benefited from globalization, especially economic globalization, whereas unskilled workers basically have suffered from globalization. I'm not saying that that is correct. I just want to plant a seed in your mind so that you consider that issue there and that comparison. Another contrast that people make has to do with um, different types of countries, strong countries or strong states versus weak states in the world. Uh, and again, the argument is that strong states in the world have benefited from globalization, whereas weaker states have not. And then there's also arguments about different parts of the governments. For instance, that government officials that are in charge of economic and financial matters have benefited from globalization because now they are more influential than, let's say, those government officials that take care of labor or social issues. In fact, I would say today that most people would be able to name who is the president of the Central Bank of the United States or who is the Secretary of the Treasury in the United States, but they would be much less likely to be able to identify by name the Labor Secretary or the name of the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services in the United States, or for that matter, in any other country in the world. And then lastly, there is this argument out there that rich countries in the world have benefited to a greater extent than poor countries in terms of the effects of globalization. Once again, I'm not saying that the table that you see right now is true or false. I wanted to give you some food for thought so that you consider some of the contrasts and some of the comparisons that experts and more broadly people are making about the effects, the consequences of globalization. In this last segment for this week, 
I would like to discuss with you the tensions that are currently building up in the global landscape as a way of beginning to understand what might be some of the future trends. And I would like to also bring to your attention some of the potential points of disruption, some of the uh, troubles that the world may be facing over the next uh, five years, 10 years, or 15 years. So this is the whole topic of what are the key tensions that are at play right now in the world. And let me make the following argument, which is that they tend to occur at the intersection, at the border, between four very important subcomponents of the global system. So the first, of course, is the economy, which for the purposes of this discussion, I am also extending to include financial aspects. And then we have a second subcomponent, which is the society and the demography, okay, so population and societies in the world. And then we have the political subcomponent, and finally the geopolitical subcomponent, how different countries in the world relate to one another. Now, I also want to make the argument that there are four key institutions that should help us, help the world, mediate those tensions and reduce them, if at all possible. One is the labor market, another one is the system of political representation, how do we choose the leaders that are going to govern ourselves? The third key institution is the state, the apparatus that governments put in place in order to manage things. And then lastly, the, uh, the fourth key subcomponent is the international system of states. So I'm going to show you a rather complex kind of flow chart showing all of these different subcomponents, all of these different institutions and then what I believe are the key drivers of change right now in the world. This is a chart that comes from a book that I've uh, co-authored and that essentially tries to anticipate what are some of the fault lines, what are some of the dangers, what are some of the risks that we're facing in the world. We're going to be discussing in this class each of the little boxes and each of the arrows that you see on this chart. What I want to discuss with you today quite briefly is that once again we have the four subcomponents starting on the upper left hand side right. We have the economy, then we have the society and the demography if you move towards the right. And then if you go to the bottom you have the political subcomponent and the geopolitical subcomponent. And what we see is things such as how the growth of cities, for example urbanization, affect fertility rates, how many babies women have on average. But it also means that social roles are changing and patterns of behavior and perhaps also patterns of consumption as people move to the cities. How that in turn affects population aging. And then population aging of course may have financial implications that will bring us all the way to the economic subcomponent on the left hand side, top left hand side of the chart and so on and so forth. So in this arguably complex figure, what you can see is how the different forces in the world are feeding onto one another and what are the kinds of risks and systemic disruptions that they may create over time. Once again, the argument that I would like you to think about today is that what we would need in the world is for the four key institutions to work properly so that we can reduce the risks. And those three, those four key institutions are the labor market, the political representation system, the state apparatus, and the international system of states. So once again, for future weeks of class, what I want you to think about is in what ways are labor markets in the world failing us? In what ways are our political systems not doing the job that they're supposed to be doing so that we can reduce the tensions in the global economy or in global financial markets or in society or when it comes to dealing with the environment. And the same goes for governments and the state apparatus and the same goes for the international system of states, how different countries come together or fail to do so in order to overcome 
the big challenges that the world is facing. So now that we've come to the end of our first week of class, I would like you to take the global literacy exercise. Don't worry, we are not going to grade your answers. However, I would like you to retake the exercise once we have gone through all of the different weeks in this class so that you can compare where you started and how much you have learned at the end of this adventure.